Greg Scomall is an accomplished marine biologist, an underwater explorer, photographer, and author. He has been a senior fisheries scientist with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries since 1987 and currently heads the Massachusetts Shark Research Program. He is also adjunct faculty at the University of Massachusetts School for Marine Science and Technology, a guest scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and an adjunct scientist with the Center for Shark Research in Sarasota, Florida. He holds an MA from the University of Rhode Island and a PhD from Boston University. And for more than 30 years, Greg has been actively involved in studying the life history, ecology, and physiology of sharks around the globe, from the Arctic Circle to the probably more pleasant coral reefs of the Central Pacific. He has written dozens of scientific research papers and appeared in a number of film and television documentaries, including programs for National Geographic, the Discovery Channel, BBC, and other television networks. His book, The Shark Handbook, The Essential Guide for Understanding the Sharks of the World, has been described as the perfect gift for any shark fans. I suspect we have a few shark fans in the audience, so please join me in welcoming Greg. Wow, thank you. I couldn't have wrote it better myself. <laughs> Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. I, I don't get to speak in Cambridge very often, uh, except for George Buckley's class uh, uh, here at Harvard, but, um, and sometimes over at the Boston Sea Rovers, but I don't get to, to uh, mostly I'm on the Cape speaking and, uh, and other parts. So it's wonderful to come up here, and thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's certainly a packed house. I will try to get through all this great material, which I think is great, um, as quickly as I can. I've got lots of photos and some data. And I think what you're going to learn from this is that we have more questions than we have answers. And that's really what this talk is about. Most of my talks focus on the bigger picture with white sharks and the ecology that we're learning. And this will include that as well. But I'm also uh, going to really focus on this predator-prey relationship, which has uh, developed off Cape Cod and humans are, are walking into. And I'm going to talk about exactly what's going on the last few summers, in particular last summer. And, and I'm going to go in the direction of what we're learning about these animals and where I hope to go over the course of the next three or four years with the research that we're doing using newer technologies. I always like to start with a, a photo of this. Um, many of us saw this movie. Um, it's, it's actually a really good movie. Um, one of my favorites, uh, and it did inspire me. When it came out, when this movie came out, I was graduating from middle school. That's a horrible photo of me. And uh, at that time, I was inspired by this film because of a central character in the film by the name of Matt Hooper. Some of you may remember this particular character. In my opinion, he had the best job on Earth, and I set my sights on actually becoming like Matt Hooper and being able to study sharks. And I'm really lucky. I mean, I got, I got my, my, uh, my old mentor, Jack Case, used, used to say, you'd rather be lucky than good. And I think I had a lot more luck than talent. But uh, I did ultimately get to where I wanted to go and study these fish. Um, in 1979, a bunch of years later, I, uh, uh, the very first white shark was tracked off the coast of Long Island by Frank Carey, who was a scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and by far the, the, the real Matt Hooper. And this was a, a, a monumental task, because Frank was building these tags in his lab, which were acoustic transmitters. And he was putting them on fish to see what they did when they were out of our sight. And, uh, and he was a pioneer in this technology. And he was the first person to put this technology on a white shark globally. And it resonated throughout the scientific community because it was this new technology that emit, emitted all these high frequency sounds. And he followed the shark for three days. And the course of that shark went from one end, basically, of Long Island to the other. And this is the state of what we knew about white shark movements, white shark ecology uh, at that time. It actually stayed like this for a couple more decades until we started tagging sharks with the newer technologies that came out. And the reason that not a lot of people had tagged white sharks, particularly in the Atlantic Ocean, is because 
it's a relatively elusive species or was an elusive species that we knew very, very little about. There are these global hotspots for white sharks, and, and they all have one thing in common, and that's the presence of large seal and sea lion colonies. And a lot of work had been done in these hotspots, Pacific and Indian Ocean, but not much in the Atlantic because we lacked that hotspot. Um, much of what I did early in my career involved studying dead fish. All right, I cut up a lot of dead fish. And you can learn a lot from a dead fish. And so a lot of my early work, uh, particularly with white sharks, involved dead animals. And so this was one of the early white sharks that I had a chance. This is back in the 80s, working at a laboratory in Rhode Island. I had a chance to cut up a very small white shark. This is about the size we think they're born. And of course, this is the size that they ultimately will attain. And what we would do during these necropsies is we take various tissue samples. And fishery scientists use this technique all the time. And if you think about it, there's a lot you can learn. If you look in the stomach, some of this stuff's obvious, right? If you look in the stomach, you could see what these animals eat. Um, some of it's not so obvious. For example, if you look at the rings in the backbone of a shark, you can come up with its age. So for my master's work, I actually did age and growth of the blue shark, where I counted rings in the vertebrae. So it, it involved cutting up a lot of blue sharks. Um, so I, uh, uh, much of what we knew about this species in the Atlantic came from a handful of specimens that fishermen had brought in for one reason or another, mostly to, to show that they were able to kill a big white shark and sometimes to take their teeth, obviously to take their teeth, and very rarely actually to actually consume them. But in 1997, we made it illegal in the United States to go out and just harvest these animals, which was a good thing because now we're seeing these populations come back. So, I always like to show my first video being an absolutely uh, uh, disgusting one because I'm going to show you what it's like to cut open a white shark. And, and it takes me back to my early roots. Most of what I do now is on live fish, and that's really more fun than cutting up dead ones. But every now and then, a white shark will beach itself, and I'm always in the right place at the right time to go ahead and dissect these things. So this is a, a time-lapse time -lapse video uh, that spanned multiple hours, but we boiled it down into just about a minute. And this was on uh, Halloween of 2016. Now, you know I work for government. Obviously, I don't work this fast. <laughs> but um, the team that I was with uh, involved scientists not only from private institutions and academia, but also the feds, National Marine Fisheries Service. And we do methodically take it apart. And all these tissues are investigated for various studies that are going on. So there's a lot to be learned from a dead fish. But what we don't learn from a dead fish is the basics regarding its behavior and its ecology and its movements. And, and that you can't get from a dead fish. So for many, many, many years, we knew nothing about those aspects except for what Frank Carey did back in 1979 in the paper he published a couple years later. In 2004, everything started to change, or we started seeing changes. And this is an actual photograph of a white shark that was trapped in a salt pond off the Elizabeth Islands. I don't remember that incident. That was a long time ago. But it was really my first indication that white sharks uh, were starting to come back in bigger numbers. And uh, the other indication we were getting is the presence of a lot of dead seals on the beaches of Cape Cod with big bite marks out of them. So we weren't actually seeing white sharks like you see here, but we were seeing more and more dead seals on the beach. And we were getting more and more random reports from fishermen and others of more white sharks around the Cape. And so we started putting two and two together. So a lot of these reports, and you see them here in red dots on these maps on the left side of the screen, uh, which are incidental, incidental reports of white sharks. And a lot of them were, were concentrated on the outer Cape. So a lot of reports coming in from fishermen, particularly through the 2000s, we saw this big bump. So we, we ran some you know, models on this, and it clearly showed that the white shark population was coming, was starting to grow. And we did an, a, a broader meta-analysis on a broader data set. And it turns out that what we're seeing is actually a rebounding population on the east coast of the United States in general. You know, all the available relative abundance indices are telling us that the population is responding to the conservation we put in place back in 1997. And we're seeing this general overall population rebound. It's not at historic highs, but it is coming back after being hit pretty hard by the development of commercial fisheries in the 80s and 90s, but also some recreational 
uh, fisheries that targeted white sharks uh, after JAWS came out. And so white sharks were also, though, not only rebounding, but redistributing themselves to near coastal areas. And we felt that that was very highly correlated with the fact that seals were coming back. Seal populations were rebounding and being restored uh, on, in the eastern seaboard of the United States. So if we look at the history of the seals, it's, very, it's quite interesting. We had actually driven it to the brink of extinction a long time ago, and we kept the populations down. We had no lo longer had breeding colonies in the United States. Some rec one author claims that we had actually driven it to the brink of extinction by the end of the, the 18th century. And so for a lot of old, old timers that come up to me and say, I've never seen these seals my whole life, it's, I said, because you're not old enough, believe it or not. These seals were gone for a very, very long time, and we had bounty systems in place through the uh, 20th century. It wasn't until 1972 that we established the Marine P Mammal Protection Act, and we afforded seal populations, like a lot of other marine mammals, uh, the highest level of protection. So now it's been almost 50 years, and seals are not only coming back to the northeastern United States and Canada, but they're recolonizing areas where they previously colonized. And when you show me big numbers of seals, obviously you're going to have something that wants to eat them. And if we look at global hotspots around the world that I mentioned earlier, where white sharks come, you know, clearly this was going to be a place that would attract white sharks, and that's exactly what's going on. So these high densities, this brand new restaurant that's opened, and it's really the reestablishment of an old restaurant, okay? It's, it's a conservation success story is what we're looking at here. So you got the prey, and the prey themselves are top predators, but then we have the top predator of the not so top predator. And, uh, and the problem we have with the sharks so close to shore trying to prey upon these seals is that we've got people there. And, uh, and anywhere we see the overlap between sharks, white sharks, and their pinniped prey with people, the probability of negative interactions goes up. And that's exactly what we're starting to see um, when you put the white shark into that mix. And so I'll talk about some of our observations first as to how we're trying to, what we're learning about this predator-prey relationship that's unfolding right on Cape Cod. Um, here we have surfers very close to us. Uh, this happens every day off Cape Cod. And the surfers know it. This particular wind surfer didn't know it at the time. Um, I understand he sold his board shortly thereafter. But uh, I'm just kidding. No, but he didn't know that shark was there. The shark obviously didn't hurt him. So we get this, the overlap between people and these sharks. And, uh, and that's starting to increase in terms of interactions between these three species. Um, the last fatal shark attack in Massachusetts was in 1936 in Mattapoisett, which is Buzzards Bay. Actually, not too far where I currently live. Um, but my kids do go in the water. You know, people always ask me, your kids go? Yeah, my kids do go in the water. And a young man was killed by swimming off Mattapoisett. Um, that's the location of that particular attack, 1936. In 2012, we had a swimmer off Truro that was bitten in the lower legs, and he survived. There were severe injuries, but not enough, not fatal. Um, and he's perfectly healthy now. Um, but he's swimming about 100 meters from shore with his son, and a white shark came up and did what we call a test bite. And lucky for him, it was just a test bite. Um, and he survived. In a, two years later, two kayakers ironically went out to look for white sharks off a small seal colony near in Plymouth. And they found one. A white shark struck one of the kayaks so, with such force that it pierced the hull of the kayaks, left marks that were very distinctive of a white shark, and knocked both kayaks and occupants of the kayaks into the water. The two ladies spent about 15 minutes in the water. The shark swam away. And they were retrieved. Fortunately, they weren't hurt. 2017, off Wellfleet, a paddle boarder was out, and a white shark uh, uh, grabbed a hold of his paddle board, bit right into the paddle board, and released him, not knocking him into the water. And of course, last year we had a swimmer, a uh, gentleman from Long Island, who was bitten severely on the upper legs, um, survived, but after a, a, lo a lot of medical attention. Um, and, of course, we had a body bo border one month later in September that was fatally struck by a white shark. So we're seeing an increase in these kinds of interactions. And as you can imagine, 
For those of us who love to go to Cape Cod, there's some concern out there. And if you manage beaches in Cape Cod, like these local towns do, like the National Park Service does, you're concerned about this. You're wondering, what do we do about it? And, uh, and I can tell you right now, they've been talking about the potential of this happening for multiple years, because I've been meeting with them for multiple years through the Regional White Shark Working Group. And, uh, and there's, no, there's, no, there's no silver bullet. Shortly after uh, Mr. Medici was killed, uh, this is the next day there were surfers out surfing at the very spot where the, the young man died. So there are, there are user groups out there that are willing to accept the risk um, in these areas. And there's not much we can do about that other than advise them that there are sharks in these areas. So what can we learn about this relationship between sharks and its prey? Because I happen to believe the more we know about that, you know, the more we know about predatory behavior, the better equipped we're going to be to advise beach managers. And, you know, we're not the first people to want to do this. I mean, there are, there are areas all around the world where people have been bitten by white sharks. And, uh, and those areas have been dealing with it, in some cases, for decades. Um, and there's no silver bullet. There's no easy solution to this. There's nothing that we can implement right now. You know, you'll hear me on the media all the time, you know, what do you think we should do, Greg? And, uh, and, I, and I go into all the statistics, the probability of shark attack, and all those things which we've all heard before. It is a very low probability. But, and I don't think we can stop it from happening. But in the near term, I know there's a couple things that I can't do. I can't change seal behavior, and I can't change shark behavior. This predator-prey relationship is going to unfold in those near-shore waters every day during the summer. And I can't stop that in the near term. I don't know if I could do it in the long term. Um, but what I can do is I can change my behavior. We can change our behavior. So that's, that's really where I am personally and, and professionally. That's the advice I'm giving to people. Yeah, we're, we're all looking for solutions. But right now, for me, studying this predator-prey relationship is very, very important. Some of you may have seen through the news media and television uh, that this is our research vessel. Um, you'll see a, a tower on the research vessel that the captain drives the boat in. You'll see me on the end of a pulpit. Okay? The pulpit it allows me to get out where the shark is without spooking the shark with the motors and the hull of the boat. So it's a really effective way for us to approach, tag, and study these animals. Um, and we're tagging free swimming fish. We're not capturing them. We're not chumming the waters. We are just placing tags in fish that are swimming along, hopefully at the cl near the surface. And this is, you can see a, a good-sized shark there. That pulpit there is uh, 10, 11 feet long, so you can get a sense of how big that particular shark is. And while we're out there, and we're out there pretty much through the summer, starting in mid-June, through October into early November while the sharks are there, while we're out there, we will occasionally see this this predator-prey relationship unfold before our, our eyes. Um, and mostly before the eyes of my spotter pilot, Wayne Davis. So all these aerial shots I'm going to show you now are captured by Wayne with his camera while he's flying a plane and looking for sharks. He's not only an incredible spotter pilot, and spotter pilots, their job is to find fish, but he's really good, incredible photographer. So here's a white shark in hot pursuit of a seal. And this seal's a smart seal. This seal's figured out that the way to get away from a white shark is you swim as fast as you can into shallow water, because big fish don't like shallow water. And so this particular seal got away. Um, this next sequence of events the, is, is very interesting. This is one that unfolded right before our very eyes. Wayne was flying. He saw this white shark swimming back and forth along the beach. And one of the things that we've learned about the seal behavior, because the seals, they're not that stupid. They figured out that something wants to eat them, all right? So what they're doing is the ones at least that have learned this or figured it out somehow or have got a little bit of age is they know they can stay as close as they possibly can to the shoreline and the sharks can't get to them. So this particular day, what you've got is this shark going back and forth, back and forth. Wayne calls us over and says, boy, this shark would love to get to those seals. Well, this particular seal didn't get the memo. All right. So you see me on the end of the pulpit here, and I'm holding a GoPro. So this particular seal came out from under our boat, like I'm just going to go back to shore, and didn't realize that there was a trap. 
And this is the second that that shark saw that seal. And anyone in this room who thinks that seal got away is right. It did, because that seal had one direction to go in and figured out that in order to get away, it had to go straight up in the air, and that's exactly what it did. So this particular photograph is of a seal jumping the next frame, seal coming out of the water, the shark following it and extending its jaws and trying to eat it, but missing. So I'm going to show you the video that I captured of that particular predator-prey interaction. I don't know what that is, but let's hope it doesn't change anything. And you'll see that in, in, in actual speed right there. And then I'll slow it down for you. So you can see that seal come straight out of the water and the shark go after it but miss. It's one of the few breaches that we've ever seen. For those of you who do turn on television and look at some of the documentaries, if you want to call them that, of white sharks, you may, um, you may always see these breaching behavior of white sharks, and that's typically in South Africa, where white sharks pin their prey to the surface, and the momentum and the speed they attain in getting to the surface to kill those seals which are at the surface carries them out of the water and into the air, and we get these great Pol Polaris launches that are, have been well captured by film and photography. Um, that doesn't happen typically in Cape Cod because we're dealing with sand dunes, shallow water, shoals, sandbars, and it's very difficult for the sharks to do that. That is one such breach. Um, we did see another breach that happened just this past, um, just this past summer. And some of you may have seen this one uh, on television. I think I see him there. You're going to hear the captain. You're going to hear the Wayne, the spotter pilot, telling me where that shark is. The water is incredibly turbid, and I'm getting the GoPro ready because the first thing I do is videotape every shark. Whoa! Holy crap! We'll show that one in slow motion again. Man! The welcome, that's, that's the white shark shuffle that you see right there. Um, for a moment in my life, I was prey. Did you guys see um, that? I know, what it, I know what it's like now to be a seal. Um, but, you know, there's a classic case, and it doesn't happen often, but these are fish, and they make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, obviously, it, it, can, be, it can be fine, because I'm in a pulpit four feet above the water and it can't get to me, or it can be fatal. Um, and this is a, a white shark that successfully killed a seal in relatively shallow water. You can see the waves breaking up there on the beach. Um, and I'm going to show you now some footage that we captured of a white shark eating a seal uh, right next to our vessel. Hopefully. So I'm videotaping the fish right there. The shark's got the seal in its mouth. The seal's dead. The seal died instantaneously. What you'll see the shark doing is trying to bite the seal into bigger hunks, smaller hunks, so it can swallow it. What the seal wants is that rich blubber layer loaded with energy. There are estimates that say that white shark eats a seal that could last anywhere from two weeks to two months. We don't know what the right answer is. Those are bioenergetics models which don't really work all that well sometimes with big fish that we don't have metabolic estimates for. Um, but here you see the, the shark, uh, not even distracted by us, just centered on consuming the seal. So now, one would think, since we're out on the water 40 times over the course of the summer, that I see this unfold every day. Um, but the truth of the matter is, I don't. I've only seen it, really, a handful of times, 13 to be precise. 
So if you want to study predator-prey behavior, an N of 13 isn't very good because some of those 13 came from third parties who reported as much information as they could to me. So I, I'm not doing a very good job of figuring out where, when, and how these sharks are killing these seals, which I think is critically important to know. But we have some data. So when I plot the data that we do have, and all the little dots that you see there are, are where we see or have witnessed actual predation events where a shark either attempts to kill or has successfully killed a seal. And you can see that it happens over a fairly broad size range of sharks, you know, three meters up to four and a half, five meters, in depths anywhere from three meters to nine meters deep, so relatively shallow. You know, uh, this, that's the temperature range we typically see these sharks in. And then, of course, during the daytime, you know. But, but the, this, this sampling is biased, right? It's biased because that's when we're out there. You know, so what's happening when we're not out there? And that's what I'm trying to get to. So we're trying to pull this information indirectly because these direct observations don't tell me enough to really describe this relationship or be able to know enough about it or quantify this relationship to the point where we could forecast where it might happen next based on all environmental variables, biotic, abiotic variables. Can we model it based on this? No. So what can I pull from our tagging data? And I told you we go out and we tag these fish. We've been tagging them since two, well, the very first shark we tagged was back in 2004. And uh, we intensified it in 2009 when the white sharks were showing up in bigger numbers around this seal colony. And uh, there's a picture of Wayne flying his plane. Usually he's hanging out the window, which folds down. Um, and he's photographing us at the same time, which is this photograph right here. Um, I'll show you a video of us actually tagging a fish from the pulpit, and you get a sense of how that, act, that, that works. But it's, it's basically, you know, teamwork, because what we need is the plane to find the shark, captain to get me close to it, and, uh, and position that boat such that I can go ahead and place the the, uh, the tag at the base of the dorsal you fin, but we all, you can see the shark right, right there underneath the pulpit, fortunately not jumping. Um, but also I need the shark to cooperate. So this particular shark takes a hard left and does a big circle and then decides to come right back toward the boat because I think it was spooked by another boat that wasn't that far away right there. So it comes back to me and I'm holding the tagging pole and I'm not throwing a harpoon I'm just placing an intramuscular dart at the base of the dorsal fin, right like that. Nice Boom. job, nice job! <laughs> nice job! Captain's pretty animated. And there you see the tag right there. That particular Whoa. tag, <laughs> I gotta admit, I'm a little more nervous than I used to be out on the pulpit. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I didn't, sometimes I just don't want to walk out there till I see the shark. Um, but, you know, that's the way it is. Uh, so we've tagged 151 sharks to date. We actually tagged a handful more off the coast of South Carolina over the last couple of months, um, one as recent as two days ago. But um, 151 off the coast of Cape Cod, which is um, a fairly broad size range, up to about 17. Uh, we did see one, that, that this one that was 17 feet is, is over 17 feet now because, believe it or not, we get to know these animals. We get to know them because we're not only tagging them, but we're videotaping them. So we're identifying who they are by individual markings on their body. So if we don't have a tag in them, we can til still tell who they are. Um, but we also are seeing them year after year after year after year. And so these sharks, which are migrating literally thousands of miles away in the off-season, like snowbirds leaving Cape Cod, they're coming back to Cape Cod, sometimes really, really similar days that they were there arriving the year before, which is remarkable navigation. Um, and this is, these are the technologies. And today I'm going to focus on two of these technologies. Um, and I'll run through them very quickly. You remember the Frank Carey paper published in 1982, the very first acoustic track. That technology now has gone commercial and has gotten better. So what Frank was building in his lab now, you could buy from a company in, in, in Nova Scotia. And, uh, and these tags now last 10 years. So I can put acoustic tag on a shark and it'll ping away for 10 years. And not only will it ping for 10 years, 
but it will tell me who that shark is. So each ping is individually coded to that shark. And it's not only used on sharks. This technology has really exploded globally. It's used on a number of species of uh, fishes all over the world just with very specific questions relative to where they spend their time in time and space. So we've put out 137 of these acoustic tags. The beauty of the acoustic tag is it lasts a long time. The downside to it, it's also relatively inexpensive. It's only about 400 bucks, which is cheap, believe me, and you'll see why in a second. Um, but the tag is only as good as the receiver arrays that you put out to hear it. So if you don't have a lot of receivers in the water to hear these tags, you're not learning a darn thing. So we have receivers that are out, and I'll show you in a second, all over Massachusetts. Anytime one of these sharks swims within a couple of hundred meters of a receiver, the receiver hears that and says, oh, I know who that shark is, and does a date timestamp for that particular shark that date, that time. So I go back, and I have to collect those data, and I can see when the, where the sharks spend their time. So you know, a lot of towns have come on board with helping us with this because they want to know whether they've got white sharks off their beaches. 20 years ago, nobody wanted to know if they had white sharks off their beaches. You know, what, what's the town? Amity, the town of Amity didn't want to know they had white sharks off their beaches. Um, so I'm going to talk, talk a lot about acoustic tags um, because they really give us a nice scale of local movements and local behavior. Um, Satellite-based technology, uh, the two most commonly used tags in the fisheries world, the fish world, are the pop-up satellite tag and the real-time satellite tag called a spot is the real-time satellite tag. The real-time satellite tag has to be bolted to the dorsal fin of the shark. And any time that shark comes to the surface, if that fin comes out of the water, communicates with a satellite, it calculates a position, and it'll give me that in real time. So I'll know where that shark is within a couple of uh, thousand meters, all right, which is not bad resolution. Right? But if the shark, which is a fish and doesn't breathe air, doesn't come to the surface, then I never hear from that, that tag again. And that, that can be problematic with fish. These tags work really, really well on marine mammals and turtles, but not so good on fish, but it's species dependent. The pop-up satellite tag is like a data logger. And it collects information about the depth and the temperature and the light levels, ambient conditions. It logs that data, collects it every 10 seconds, and logs it like a, just a regular archival tag. And then it'll actually pop off the animal at a date programmed by us. So we can have that tag come off, float to a surface, and then transmit those data to a satellite, which are then relayed to us. So we do a retrospective analysis of the three-dimensional movements of the shark. Those are my favorite tags because they're very reliable for the most part. They're, they're $4,000, so they better be, right? Um, and we will get three-dimensional movement information from them, and then we're not reliant on the shark to come to the surface or go over to a, a, a receiver. So these pop-up satellite tags, we've used quite a few, and we use them typically to look at the broader scale movements of the animals when they leave Cape Cod. Um, a lot of people ask us, where do we see white sharks on Cape Cod? And I love to show them this. <laughs> What's so funny? All right, these are not individuals, but these are places where we have seen sharks, okay? So you say to yourself, oh, no problem, I'll just swim anywhere in here, right? Well, our study area goes from there to there. <laughs> so, um, again, we're always worried about biased sampling, so we've got some biased sampling here, but we didn't have an unlimited budget, and, and it's hard to work in these other areas and all this. So. We are expanding into Cape Cod Bay, for those of you who do uh, like the bay. So this is effort-dependent information, which tells us that white sharks are everywhere, OK? They're everywhere. And so um, we're, <laughs> we're not relying on these particular data, though, to tell us uh, their total distribution. We're relying on the acoustic data to tell us that. Um, so these are acoustic receivers, okay? These are not sharks. Each one of these red dots represent an acoustic receiver that we've put out in the water. So anytime a white shark swims within a couple of hundred meters of one of these receivers, it detects it and logs it, all right? The, this was a receiver array we put out for codfish work that my agency was doing. A lot of these receivers, like, don't, don't be nervous about these. That's, <laughs> that's sturgeon work that we're doing. 
all right? This is striped bass work we're doing. Um, and what's nice is you could tag any animal you want with this technology, right? Um, and it will detect the species no matter what species it is, okay? The technology is, is seamless it's, uh, as long as you're using this particular brand. So researchers have, are making this company a lot of money. Um, and that's, so that's our array as of now. And there are still spaces that we need to fill in. Um, so if you're, you're wondering, now you're wondering, well, where do, you detect the, the dec the, where do you detect those darn sharks? This next slide is going to tell you that. And it's going to be proportional to the, in, the number of detections we get, OK? So these are just bubble, bubbles that are locations of receivers, OK? And the bigger the bubble, the more detections slash sharks that we get on that particular receiver. And as you can see, yes, the sharks do go inside Cape Cod Bay, but the numbers do taper and reduce as you move north to the point where we don't get very many detections at all. And the case of Buzzards Bay and Vineyard Sound, very few, if not none, no detections of our tagged fish. So we know, you know we have receivers in these areas, but they are not picking up the sharks. And of course, we think this is driven by the presence of their prey out here. OK, so there's no, no rocket science happening here. Show me big piles of seals, and I'm going to show you white sharks wanting to eat them. So we can look at, we could start to, from these detection data, you know, model their movements and look at where they are in two-dimensional space, right? Um, we could look at their seasonality. You know, a lot of surfers ask me this, when, when are they not here, Greg? And so these are the number of detections over the course of the year. And this is not dependent on us going out and looking, so it's effort independent, right? And we can see that June, very, very few sharks are detected, but it starts to ramp up in July with the peak months being August, September, and October. And then as water temperature starts to drop dramatically through October into November, the number of detections goes down and the sharks leave, all right? So it's temperature dependent. So these animals are, are here. It's a season. The, steel, the seals are here year round in big numbers, but the sharks are only here uh, as dictated by temperature requirements. So we, now we have seasonality. But I want to drill deeper into this relationship that's happening between sharks and seals. So we can start to plot individual movements of white sharks. And so you'll see their names pop up here. All right, many of them have, all of them almost have names, right? And if you told me 20 years ago I'd name a fish, I'd say you're crazy. But I found out it really helps with fundraising. <laughs> 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 and you know, people do relate to these fish more if you put a name on it, you know? And I'm, I'm trying to get away from this, 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 this evil character that's often portrayed to them on television and movies. Um, so these are the individual movements just in this one part of Cape Cod. So we could look at those and we could say, OK, we can start to model what might be driving these nearshore movements. But again, it's not telling me a lot about the direct interactions between white sharks and their prey. And what's really missing is the fact I don't have a lot of tags on seals. So I'm studying only one half of the equation, and that's incredibly frustrating. Um, and for those of you who know anything about seals, you know that there's not a lot of money out there to study them. It's a, it's a species that the gray seal in particular, but most seals, you know, they've, they've gotten a lot of attention. Their populations have come back, and there isn't a tremendous need to dump money into protecting them or studying them, apparently. Um, so sadly, we don't know a lot about the other side of the equation. But we can look at three of our friendly characters here, James, Lumpy, and Cool Beans. And I don't always name these. As a matter of fact, I name very few. So these really bad names are not my fault. But what I want you to see here, if we plot out where these particular sharks like to spend their time, these are heat maps. So all I want you to look at here are these really bright areas. And what it shows is that James loves it off of Orleans. And uh, Lumpy is a monomoy shark. And there's no particular preferences for this particular shark, Cool Beans, even though it does tend to avoid uh, where, where James is hanging out. Um, so we're seeing these almost seemingly territorial behaviors emerge from these data sets. It gives you a sense of, of uh, the kinds of information we can pull from these long-term acoustic tags. And we can model this from year to year to year to year and look for consistency not only within a particular individual, but between individuals. So one of the other things we're doing right now is we're modeling the pop population size of white sharks out there. So this movement ecology factors into that. Uh, 
based on the methods that we're using. So knowing where these animals are in three-dimensional space is great. But I don't have receivers everywhere, right? So to see what these sharks are doing over the course of the summer, when they're not uh, in the range of one of our receivers, remember, they got to be fairly close to a receiver in order to be detected. Um, certainly, they're not being picked up all the time. So if we plot those individual movements. We, we know there are times or periods in a day where we don't know where the sharks are. To figure out that aspect of it, we use some really short-term pop-up satellite tags. And remember, these tags record depth and temperature and light levels. And we used it on individuals that we knew, like the Jameses, the Lumpies, and the Cool Beanses in the world, ones that we know hang out for the whole summer, our resident sharks, if you will. And so one of these sharks we tagged, this is a good example, on, on July 20th of 17, and the tag popped up uh, a month later or thereabouts. And we knew the shark at least was in the area at the day we tagged it and the day the tag came off. So we plotted data for a number of these tags. And it turns out, when you look at each of these individuals, that they're not spending the bulk of their time, or all of their time, in super shallow water hunting, but they're also diving to depths sometimes in excess of 50, 60, 70 meters deep. So they're not always hugging the shoreline. So we've modeled these particular data in an effort to try to figure out whether there's any particular pattern here. Is it time of day? Is it tide? Is it current? What is it? Water temperature, nothing so far has emerged as a factor that's driving this behavior. But this data set allows us to take it uh, three-dimensionally from two-dimensionally. The acoustic tags, basically two-dimensional data, three-dimensional data from these pop-up satellite tags, where these sharks clearly are making excursions offshore, but there does not appear to be any particular uh, pattern to that movement offshore into deeper water. Um, what we can do is we can statistically say that there's a 50% probability that each of these sharks is going to be in water less than 30 feet deep at any given moment. All right. So for those of you who are going to the beach, I'm sure that's something that's going to be imprinted on your mind. But the sharks are basically spending quite a bit of time, at least 50% of their time, in the shallow water. And that's what we get from these data. So these are those individual sharks, and this is just a, a histogram that shows their depths. And of course, the closer you are to zero, the closer you are to you know, very shallow water. And so the, you can see that the bulk of these animals, although they make excursions into deeper water, spend their time in shallow water. And of course, we can get temperature data as well from these tags. And there are, there are some similarities in their patterns, but they're not all in the same areas. And Cape Cod Bay is a very different habitat than, than the outer Cape. And we're seeing movement between those two areas. So as much as I love these tags, and, and we did some predictive modeling, and the only factor that came out that made any sense statistically, but doesn't make any sense to me any other way, is moon phase. There seemed to be uh, a, a greater probability on a full moon that the sharks would not be in shallow water. All right, so that doesn't make a lot of sense. That's, intuitively, that doesn't make a lot of sense. One would think that during a full moon, the sharks would be in shallow water hunting seals because they have better visibility with a full moon's illumination. But that has not emerged yet. So, but this is an example of the kinds of predictive modeling that we're hoping to achieve with these data sets as more and more data come in. And, and if we can have some kind of forecast as to when these sharks are likely to be in certain areas, then I think that, uh, that, that at least gives some beach managers uh, information that they can work with. I'm not sure we'll ever get there. Um, but what we're still lacking, and I'm going to wrap things up with this new technology, what we're still lacking, though, are those direct observations, particularly at times of the day when we're not out there. You know, we always, shark scientists, and it's based on old literature published a while ago, um, used to say, you know, avoid swimming at dawn and dusk because that's when sharks are most actively feeding. And that's, that is actually true for some, some species. It's never really been demonstrated with white sharks on Cape Cod. And you'll see it written on the signs, beware, don't swim at dawn and dusk. Um, but we actually have no data to back that up because we're actually not on the water at dawn and dusk. You know? And we're not collecting observations. But we have the technologies out there that can collect data when we're not there so we can see these direct observations between sharks and seals. So we started testing some of this technology uh, a couple of years ago. 
by actually putting camera systems on sharks. And uh, um, it's, it's just a testament to how far technology has come over the course of the last couple of decades. Um, and here's the old guy story, right? When I was in college, we didn't have laptop computers, right? We didn't. I didn't. <laughs> and uh, we used mainframe, mainframe computers that, you know, my phone's more powerful than those now, right? Um, and now we're actually strapping laptop computers with camera systems to these fish so we can get direct observation. So I'll show you a couple more videos of, uh, of where we're taking this research um, and what we might learn from it. And these will, this will provide direct observation. So here's a shark that we actually put one of these tags on. And it's a clamp, it's a clamp system. And you'll see the shark uh, swim by with the clamp on its back. <clears throat> What's beautiful about these tags is they not only record observations, the camera's running. You could program the camera to run whenever you want as, and triggered by whatever movements you want. But also the tags are collecting three-dimensional information, information on the fine scale of movements of the shark itself. So you could derive speed of travel, direction of travel, tail beat frequency, orientation in the water column. So in essence, by looking at these data, we can determine when a feeding event might be happening. And then if we have direct observations from the camera system itself, we could start to get a sense of where, when, and how these sharks are feeding. So this is the technology that we're going to be deploying quite a bit this year off the coast of Cape Cod. And here is um, some footage actually from that particular camera. This is when the tag goes clamped onto the fin. Now, with camera tags, you have to get the cameras back, which is tricky, <laughs> which is tricky. They are designed to come off the shark after a certain amount of time. That's the easy part. But then you have to retrieve them. So this is the, the view of a, this is what a white shark sees. Okay? This is a really boring lifestyle. And if you think that's me with a GoPro trying to videotape the, the white shark as it swims by, that footage you saw before. All right, so this is the view. And you'll see, you may see the nose of the shark down here. Just barely make out the nose of the shark as it moves through the water and uh, hits up really close to the surface. These are the beautiful crystal clear waters of Cape Cod. For those divers in the room, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, uh, and, and if you ever have to look at footage like this, it goes on and on and on and on, and it's really, really, really boring. Um, for colleagues of mine who have used this technology on other parts of the world, they tell me that the shark by far spends the bulk of its time doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> They don't have a job. They don't have to do anything. They just have to eat and make baby sharks, as Matt Hooper once said. So this, this shark actually came up to the surface for a little bit. And I think at one point, it actually comes up toward our boat. So it comes and checks us out um, as, uh, as it's swimming along here. So these tags can be deployed. At first, it was just on the order of hours. But now you can keep them out for longer periods of time because Batteries and memory and, and all those things have changed dramatically in the last few years. So we're hoping to deploy them for periods of, of several days. And I, and I think if a shark doesn't feed in several days, I'd be absolutely amazed. Here's the, here's the tag still on the shark, and it's, it's swimming toward our boat. Um, but this is, this is where I believe we need to go, and that's a, so we could actually look at these three-dimensional movements of the sharks uh, as they, they uh, move into shallow water to feed. Um, here's the data from this particular tag, and it's just a good example of what you can get. This is just a fraction of the data that can come from it. But here's the depth of the shark itself. Uh, so it's moving basically from the surface down to about 120 feet deep, and then back up again. This is its, uh, its orientation in the, in the water column. This is the pitch of the shark, so the angle of the shark as it's swimming down. And then what's really cool is this is the tail beat frequency. And what you can see here is the shark is basically gliding not moving its tail at all as it moves down and then uh, increases its tail beat frequency as it ascends. So it's just a tiny snapshot into the information we can pull from these high resolution tags. And if you couple the actual observations from the cameras themselves on top of that, it, it, it's, uh, it, it'll provide a brand new information on the behavior of these animals. So as we move into the next phase of our research, we're going to start drilling deeper into this fine scale behavior which I've been talking about. We'll not only mine our tagging data, but we'll be deploying new technologies, including these accelerometer tags. We'll still be looking at these other aspects of the biology of these animals, including broad-scale migration and population monitoring. 
Um, and with that, I will thank a whole bunch of people who have uh, helped me over the years in terms of financial support and otherwise. Um, Jane mentioned the book that I have out, the Shark Hand book is the second edition now. This one's a great kid's book about the research we did, uh, written by Cy Montgomery, which of these books are available through all the major outlets. And with that, if I have time, I will, um, I will take some questions. Thank you.